thank you, Albert, for that wholly disarming introduction. Um, who but a friend could uh, do that to one on this occasion? But frankly, the audience is so full of friends that I uh, certainly feel at home, and thank you all for coming. Um, now, uh, these are themes that I've been kicking around for three or four years, and I've given a number of papers on some aspects. This is an attempt to pull it together in a certain way, and it does involve some very broad reflections on how bioethics has emerged and has developed across, oh dear, 30 to 40 years. Um, let me start, therefore, by talking a little bit about its trajectory during that time. For the most part during that time, bioethics has had an intense focus on medical ethics and specifically, of course, on the treatment of individual patients. It has aimed and been admired for trying to reconceive relationships between patients and medical professionals, in particular doctors, and this preoccupation with clinical ethics has, of course, unsurprisingly been mainly concerned with clinical ethics in rich societies with high-tech hospitals and the rest of it. It had, at least until recently, though I think the tide is now well turned, less to say about the ethics of public health, about the health problems of poorer societies, although they suffer a higher proportion of the global disease burden. And it had rather little to say for many of those years about the connections between health and environment. Why did it begin? Well, I think a lot has been written on that. The delivery of health care in the rich world shifted from one-to-one -one direct and often long-term relationships between patients and doctors, where each party knew the other and could make reasonable judgments about that other into a system of increasingly complex health care provided in complicated institutional settings where patients face a phalanx of professionals, each with a fleeting presence in their lives, which of course undermined their capacity to judge probity or competence, and so to place or refuse trust with discrimination. Medical research changed in parallel ways. It was less and less undertaken, as it had been, though we now forget this, by individual doctors. It was increasingly done by research teams with many members, complex organization, multiple funding. These transformations were well described 20 years ago in David Rothman's work with the arresting title, Strangers at the Bedside. And they've been analysed in many works subsequently, including recently, and I think very perceptively, in Renee Fox and Judith Swayze's study, Observing Bioethics. But in some respects, that title of Rothman's underplayed the magnitude of the transformation, because the people who appeared so briefly at bedsides, and all those others who never even came near a bedside, were no mere strangers. They had highly specialised knowledge and considerable power to provide or refuse or choose interventions. There was therefore a heightened imbalance between knowledge and power, and this was seen, rightly or wrongly, as a source of risk to patients and research subjects, and one of the aims of modern bioethics was to limit that risk. In short, I think uh, the diagnosis which says it was always a mistake to dr trust doctors was simply an ahistorical projection onto a world in which the evidence base for placing and refusing trust was a good deal more accessible to patients. Now, as it's well known, writing on medical ethics addressed these questions in the main by arguing that those traditional, supposedly paternalistic relations between doctors and patients, I think they weren't necessarily paternalistic, and also between researchers and research subjects, were defective and that they should be replaced by more formal relationships and procedures that would protect patients and research subjects. And this was to be achieved in part by requiring the informed consent of patients and research subjects, who, of course, were now promoted to be research participants. I don't know whether the promotion uh, really seemed so convincing to the research uh, participants. And that informed consent 
would have to be given to any treatment or research, and it was achieved in part by regulating and restructuring healthcare systems and research governance to meet much more explicitly formulated and more numerous ethical and other standards. The transformations were often seen, indeed praised, as replacing relations of trust with procedures that ensured respect for what's conventionally called the autonomy of patients and research subjects. And this transformation has, of course, taken place in various forms in most developed countries, and it's now often seen as uncontroversial. That's a topic I've addressed in other works, and I'm commenting on some of what I take to be its ethical, philosophical, and practical shortcomings. So I'm not really going to talk about autonomy and informed consent today. My focus is going to be on some of the questions that have been marginalized by the measures taken to secure that supposed autonomy and to spread informed consent procedures through biomedicine. I begin by noting, and it seems to me probably it's the underlying message of this lecture, it's nothing new, but you will recognize it, that contemporary medical ethics has been radically individualistic, focusing on the individual patient and his or her consent to medical treatment or research interventions. So it has lots to say about the rights, or quite often the supposed rights, of patients and research subjects when it addresses questions of justice, and it does address those to some extent, it focuses almost entirely on goods that can be distributed to individuals, such as health care. A whole spectrum of work on issues ranging from assisted reproduction to genetic enhancement has also focused on the provision and just distribution of interventions to individuals. Think of all that work on so-called reproductive autonomy or on genetic choice. But it's been much less concerned with wider, let alone global, public health implications of new technologies. Recently, it's true, quite a lot of writers have taken broader views of the matter. For example, Norm Daniels, who focused largely on health care in his, in, at the time, I think, quite pioneering 1985 work, Just Health Care, takes a broader approach to health and justice in his 2008 book, Just Health, nice pun. In this work, however, he still mainly discusses health care, but he redefines it in a subtle way. He takes it more broadly as including, I quote, both medical services and public health measures since both are functionally aimed at individual and population health. I'm unsure whether that is a sufficient broadening of focus, but it takes us some way. It seems to me that a focus on clinical care supplemented by a focus on those public health interventions that are functionally aimed both at individuals and at populations may still be too much concerned with distributable goods and their just allocation to individuals, and that this may still be too narrow a focus for a broader form of bioethics that can take the full range of questions, including questions about public health and global health, seriously. Now, in recent years, as I said, things have been improving, and in this, the Nuffield Council's work has often been trend-setting. A number of the Council's reports have taken questions about public health and global health issues head-on. This, I think, largely reflects that focused remit that the Council was given, which requires it, quote, to identify and define ethical questions raised by recent advances in biological and medical research in order to respond to, and as Albert said, anticipate public concern. But since many of the ethical question ra questions raised by research are not questions about its implications for individuals or for distributing goods to individuals, and in particular not about their implications for patients, the Council had an advantage in beginning with this broader focus. I think that is what has been valuable all the way, and uh, you know, I, I pay tribute to uh, late Brian Flowers, who was uh, my predecessor as chair of the Nuffield Foundation at the time the Council was established, but above all also to Patrick Nairn, who chaired the Council in its first years and had been permanent undersecretary in the Department of Health 
and saw a need. There was then, there still is now, an occasional debate, don't we need a national council on bioethics? An interesting question to debate, but I won't. Uh, my answer is uh, one better look at the costs as well as the benefits and one better look at what has happened in countries that have national councils on bioethics. Um, so um, I think public health professionals have always been in the better position. They have always taken a broader view because they've always focused on types of action policy or structure that affect population health. And although the aim of public health interventions is often geographically restricted, if you're interested in clean air or clean water, it's in a region, the approach is not intrinsically individualistic. Now, some public health measures do not target interventions on identifiable individuals. Here we can't say with any certainty that specific public health activities, policies, structures have been instrumental in protecting or improving the health of particular individuals. For example, measures to improve air and water quality, food and product safety, the design of housing, roads, transport or other products do aim to protect and in some ways to improve population health. So do measures that set standards for medical uh, training or drug safety. But we can't sensibly talk about the level of benefit that a particular individual receives from these measures. Although we can, of course, make statistical generalizations about the average health of persons in populations with and without particular measures. And we can note significant differences when we do so. So public health measures are not targeted always on particular individuals and the benefit they produce is typically dispersed among a population. We can't tell who's benefited to what degree, who would have fared just as well without a specific public health measure, or indeed who may have been harmed and there will be cases of harm. Now this case of, uh, differs I think from that of public health measures that use individually targeted interventions immunization is an obvious example, where the individuals who are immunized benefit, but others may benefit indirectly from increased herd immunity. Here it makes sense to speak both of a level of benefit to an individual and of a level of benefit to the population. In short, the intervention is targeted, but the benefit spreads beyond the target. Now, I think that both non-targeted public health measures and targeted health interventions generally have to be paid for by public funds. Uh, where a public health measure is not targeted on any individual, although its benefits are to reach some or many members of a population, individuals may have no immediate interest in accepting, let alone funding, the provision. Even where a public health measure is targeted on individuals, but the benefits accrue more widely, some individuals will, of course, be tempted to free ride, and we've seen plenty of this with immunization. In either case, market failure would be likely if the intervention had to be paid for by individuals, so collective provision and legal enforcement are likely to be needed. This means that public health measures are often politically contentious, and that is, I think, another reason why excessively individualistic approaches in bioethics are not likely to address them effectively. Now, how does that bear on global health? I think in the following way. Some work on global public health has argued that certain public health provisions can be seen as global public goods and that they are in everybody's interest. If true, that would surely be politically very important. Where everybody benefits, it should be easier to persuade everybody to contribute, although, and to participate, although free riding, of course, might uh, remain a problem. But it seems to me too fast a move. Some public health measures provide public goods, others don't. Public goods, in the strict sense, are non-rivalrous or non-excludable or both. There are, of course, cases where, where these come apart, and I'm not going to talk about common goods or club goods as economists discuss them. 
Goods are non-rivalrous if they're not depleted by use. For example, safe streets, a medical database, knowledge of how to manage a safe maternity service are all non-rivalrous goods. Nobody will have less of them if others too enjoy them. By contrast, the safe delivery of a baby is rivalrous as well as excludable in that a midwife or obstetrician who's delivering one baby won't be available at that time to deliver the other baby. Goods are non-excludable if it's impossible to exclude others from enjoying them too if they're, if, if they're provided or at least impossible to exclude them cheaply and their enjoyment by additional people has no or little additional cost. Systems for ensuring food safety or a stable currency or a high uptake of immunizations are examples of non-excludable goods. By contrast, a plateful of safe food <coughs> is an excludable as well as a rivalrous good. You can prevent someone having it, whereas if you've gone and made the food safe, it then becomes a special project to ensure that someone gets unsafe food, doesn't it? Now, some recent writing, um, I think less of it than a few years ago, is very optimistic about the possibility of identifying public goods that are highly relevant to health, including specifically so-called global public goods of high relevance to health. If there is a significant range of global public goods, even for that matter regional public goods, that are highly relevant to health, providing them would surely be important for public health policy, and in particular for those public health programs that aim at global impact. So if there are true global public goods that bear on health, providing them would be of in, in the interest both of those able to contribute and for those who cannot, and that's sort of politically quite interesting, if true. This line of thought was, as I'm sure many of you know, taken up by the United Nations Development Programme with the aim of building coalitions to support the provision of the supposed global public goods. Kofi Annan, when Secretary General championed this approach, claiming that, I quote, no country can achieve these global public goods on its own and neither can the global marketplace. Efforts must now focus on the missing term of the equation, global public goods. Now, in some cases, this may seem a plausible view of public health measures. For example, the eradication of smallpox is a benefit to everyone wherever they live. The disease was highly transmissible and serious, even when controlled in some regions and countries. And it remained prevalent elsewhere and created risks that could only be managed, for example, by immunization and travel restriction. Another example of a global public good might be a program of effective action to prevent and to treat a rapidly spreading, highly transmissible disease which crosses inevitably crosses boundaries. For example, had SARS proved as transmissible as was initially feared, then given its death rate and seriousness, there would have been a good case for international action, whether it was mandatory monitoring of those exposed or mandatory immunization if a vaccine had been developed or restrictions on travel or quarantine. And, of course, should SARS or another serious infection mutate and become readily transmissible between humans, that's a situation that we could face again. However, I think it's very much less plausible to regard the eradication of the diseases of poverty as a global public good. Reducing the incidence of these diseases requires a reduction of poverty. And that's a great good, but in large measure a distributable rather than a public good. High-level characterizations of projects that aim to eradicate or contain serious transmissible diseases look to me like the best cases cited of global or sometimes regional public goods with high relevance to public health. But even here, not every aspect of action taken to eradicate or contain these diseases is going to be a public good, let alone a global public good. Uh, programs that target HIV AIDS are a good example. Um, Richard Smith and Landis McKellar argued that even if the aim of containing the spread of HIV AIDS could count as a global public good, let's grant that, uh, still many of the measures used to achieve containment can't. They point out that providing subsidized antiretroviral therapy, ART, to aid sufferers in low-income countries is simply not a public good. ART, they write, is rivalrous, 
therapy made available to one person or nation can't be made available to another, and excludable persons can be barred from receiving it. By contrast, they say, AIDS prevention in the form of media campaigns, condom distribution, voluntary counselling and testing, reduction of sexually transmitted infections and encouragement of male circumcision is non-rival. That is, if A remains HIV negative as a result of a prevention program, his sex partners B and C are equally protected and non-excludable. No one can prevent C from enjoying the same protection as B. End of quotation. Well, that does seem to me a sober correction of the sum of the more, of some of the more enthusiastic claims about the possibility of basing public health policies on arguments for the importance of global public goods. But I think there are grounds for being yet more sober. Some measures taken in HIV AIDS prevention work are genuine public goods, but many are not. In the abstract, public education about HIV, AIDS and safe sex, health promotion and nudges may look like public goods, but specific aspects of these prevention policies, although they're relatively cheap, will be targeted on some individuals, not on others, although the benefit may spread to others. Health is promoted here by providing finite distributable resources, whether we're talking about leaflets or education, advertisements or nudges. These interventions may be cheap, but they are rivalrous and excludable and they are not public goods. Health promotion is a targeted intervention. It is aimed at some recipients, not at others. Probably the best examples of genuine public goods are systems that have to be universally provided. For example, a stable currency, rules of the road, and abstract entities that in the nature of the case are non-depletable, non-rivalrous and non-excludable. Ideas, knowledge, standards and laws are genuine public goods. And some of them genuine public goods because laws are generally an exception since they're non-global. It needs a lot of effort to treat abstract entities as private goods. As we all know, intellectual property law successfully construes certain abstract entities, such as texts or musical works or inventions, as ownable, tradable items that are rivalrous and excludable. Here, points of control have been defined that allow the exclusion of non-owners from free access to these abstract entities, typically by regulating their access to material copies or performances or to activities and transactions by which ideas are shared, knowledge is transferred or standards are promulgated. So although abstract entities aren't rivalrous or excludable, there is a way of making their uses rivalrous and excludable. However, the thought that abstract entities are genuine public goods, even genuine global public goods, has, I think, not been particularly helpful to those who hope to argue for public health policies. We live in an era in which persistent attempts are made to extend intellectual property regimes to ensure that uses of abstract entities are not treated as public goods, but as proprietary assets that may be controlled by their owners. And as you'll know, this is a shifting and highly contested frontier. On the, other ha on the one hand, proponents of extensive intellectual property regimes have certainly become more militant. Patents are filed on smaller inventive steps. Steps are taken to control manufacturing of generic drugs. Holders of copyright exert strict control of secondary rights, putting pressure on traditional fair use exemptions that allow individual to, to a com individuals to copy limited amounts of material for private study, review, criticism and research. However, I would suggest that this more aggressive approach reflects the reality that major holders of intellectual property, today for example including pharmaceutical companies and publishers, are under very great pressure. They're often fighting a rearguard commercial battle in a world of increasing open access publishing, plentiful piracy and rampant plagiarism, all of which weaken intellectual property rights and erode their traditional roles, whether as the reward for originality or their current roles as tradable corporate assets.
So I think it's not surprising that various initiatives question current intellectual property regimes and seek to change them, and some of these initiatives may be highly relevant to public and global health. For example, the Health Impact Fund, and I'm sure many of you are in touch with that and know Thomas Pogger, which seeks an alternative to the patent regime for rewarding innovation in pharmaceuticals or the Drugs for Neglected Diseases initiative. But these initiatives interesting as they are, don't, and I think can't, provide a general basis for thinking that uses of ideas, as opposed to the ideas themselves, are global public goods. Uses of ideas aren't abstract entities, and they are often targeted, rivalrous, and excludable. Perhaps unsurprisingly, when you actually get round to looking at the definition of public goods used in the United Nations Development Programme sponsored work, um, I'm refer particularly to their book, uh, Global Public Goods, International Cooperation in the 21st Century, you find that the definition they're relying on is much weaker than the economist's definition. The authors state that, I quote, public goods are recognized as having benefits that cannot easily be confined to a single buyer or set of buyers, unquote. Well, this much weaker condition is met by many goods, including both non-targeted public health measures and public health interventions that target individuals where the intervention is rivalrous and excludable, but whose benefits are spread to other individuals, so the benefits are in part non-rivalrous and non-excludable. Most public health interventions are goods with beneficial externalities rather than genuine global public goods. That may be a rather disappointing conclusion, but that's where I got to. The political point of claiming that certain policies promote global public goods is, I think, clear enough. We know why this is so tempting. It's meant to suggest that providing these goods is no mere humanitarian task, but something in which everybody's got an interest. It's meant to suggest that arguments from self-interest can carry us all the way to providing these goods to all. A focus on goods with dispersed benefits is, I think, however, likely to be more fruitful for a broader bioethics than a search for global public goods in the strict sense of the term. So let me turn now, more modestly, to targeted interventions with dispersed benefits. It's tempting to think that the problem of getting coordinated international action to deal with global health problems could be helped by identifying genuine global public goods, but this is not likely to be enough. Much that's needed for public health improvements, locally or globally, is the provision of non-targeted health measures or targeted health interventions that spread benefits beyond their targets, and we have to accept that it may not be in everybody's interest to contribute to these interventions or to their costs. Both, of course, are unlike clinical treatment that is indeed targeted and is provided for a particular patient where the benefit is meant to be for that patient. Non-targeted measures clearly do not aim, in any case, to benefit particular individuals. Targeted interventions aim to benefit not only those targeted but others. Indeed, sometimes they don't fail if they don't benefit the individual targeted. For example, anti-smoking advice might be targeted on A. A takes the leaflet home, but remains regrettably indifferent. But the leaflet is then read by B and C, who stop smoking. So although it was targeted, it had its beneficial effects on others. HIV containment policies may influence some but not others in a targeted population, yet can be highly effective if the targeting disperses benefits. I think the importance of strengthening public health measures and interventions with an eye to the distribution, the further distribution of their benefits beyond targeted individuals, can be illustrated by contrasting the differential effects of a pragmatic HIV AIDS prevention campaign, emphasizing safe sex and clean needles for high-risk populations, such as has been taken in Australia, and the more moralistic approach that was for a considerable time taken by some US-funded HIV-AIDS prevention policies, which 
aim these individualistic interventions at lower risk individuals, uh, encouraging things like uh, teenage sexual abstinence or discouraging multi-partner sex. Now those may be very nice things, but they weren't very effective interventions for reducing HIV AIDS. Pragmatic responses that target those at most risk and spread the benefits have turned out to work better than policies that target those at less risk. Programs such as the glorious, it's a glorious acronym, PEPFAR, which was the, the uh, late Bush administration presidency emergency plans for aid relief, placed tight constraints on interventions targeting those high-risk groups such as commercial sex workers and injecting drug users, wrong people to spend the money on it seems. But actually failing to, to do things for those groups proved relatively ineffective. Some commentators concluded rather bluntly that it's hard to consider PEPFAR as a collective provision of a global public good when its prevention programs are designed to cater to a domestic political constituency, which may be a point. Let me go back to targeting and benefits. A focus on public health interventions that appeals to global public goods is, I think, at best, moderately helpful. The most relevant goods aren't, often aren't public goods. A fortiori, not global public goods in the strict sense of the term. They're a mixture of non-targeted goods that met benefit many and targeted goods with benefits that spread beyond their targets, just as the harms of some malign activities such as violent crime often spread beyond their targets. Both targeted and non-targeted public health activity raise distinctive ethical questions and I believe it should be part of the task of a broader form of bioethics to address these. Non-targeted public health measures aren't a minor aspect of public health uh, uh, ethics which most of us needn't think about. They are, I believe, presupposed by all but the most rudimentary clinical interventions, by which I mean that uh, if I uh, 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 wash your wound in a stream, I'm not pr uh, presupposing any public health measures. But modern clinical medicine relies on many structures, facilities, technologies, and standards that have to be a, pr provided at agreed level. These provisions are not matters for choice nor therefore for informed choice by individual patients. Individual patients may, of course, uh, give or refuse consent to certain treatments. That's what uh, so much of, of contemporary bioethics has been about. But they can't, for example, choose the level of training their doctors receive, or the safety standards for licensing drugs before they take them, or the, even the safety culture of the hospitals they go to. All of these systems and structures are debatable matters in other contexts, but for individual patients at the point of consenting to treatment, they are just givens. Medical practice is therefore not just a set of transactions between freestanding agents. It's framed by public health and other provisions that are not and cannot be matters for consent or choice, whether by individual patients or by individual practitioners. This, it seems to me, gives us some reason to think that public health ethics is actually more fundamental than clinical ethics. Clinical ethics presupposes public health ethics. Now, targeted public health interventions also must be judged not only by the extent to which they benefit their immediate targets, but by the extent to which they confer benefit or harm more widely. For the individualistic bioethics that's been dominant for 30 years, that looks problematic. Is not using an individual in ways intended to benefit others exactly what we have been telling one another is unacceptable? Yet, we can see that clinical ethics too constantly faces situations in which interventions to benefit one, in fact, affect others. In treating an individual patient, benefit is of course intended primarily for the individual patient. But everyone knows that others too may benefit. The patient's family, friends and carers will benefit if health improves. If the condition is transmissible, effective treatment may benefit others who might have contracted the condition. If it's a rare condition, successful treatment may ben benefit future patients by improving the knowledge base for their treatment. In other cases, treatment for the benefit of a particular patient may harm others. 
medically futile treatment will use up resources that might have been used better for others. Poor decisions about the treatment of transmissible diseases or psychiatric conditions can result in third-party injury. And in medical research, the dispersal of benefit is even more fundamental. Its central aim is, after all, to acquire knowledge to be used for better treatment of subsequent cases. So I think both non-targeted public health measures and targeted public health interventions aim to benefit many. Although the incidence of wider benefit can't be foreseen, its amount can sometimes be estimated prospectively and often measured retrospectively. By comparing population health before and after the measures are introduced or the interventions undertaken. So these facts suggest to me that too strong a focus on individual choice and informed consent by patients and research subjects will not only marginalise public health and ethical, the ethical questions it raises, but they'll hide a great deal that is fundamental to clinical medicine and to the conduct of biomedical research. So a few ethical conclusions out of all that. If bioethics is to address the broad range of ethical issues raised by public health policy, including targeted interventions, I think it has to place discussions of choice, consent and autonomy in the context of a wider and more fundamental range of ethical issues. Consent procedures are a useful way, though not the only way, of assuring ourselves that an intervention is not, for example, forced, coercive, deceptive, manipulative, and not likely to injure. Needless to say, consent doesn't provide total assurance that an intervention won't injure. Assurance is limited because there may be inadequate information about the effects of an intervention, because individuals don't grasp that information when they consent, because they choose against their own interests, because risks are hard to foresee, because consent can't be sought from all the people who may be affected, or just because something goes wrong. None of those cases, by the way, is unusual. Fortunately, however, consent procedures aren't the only way of giving ourselves some assurance that basic ethical norms are not breached, as we know from the many cases in which persons without competence to consent are treated on the basis of considering their best interests. What matters, I believe, is not the formality of obtaining consent, though that is something we have fetishized, but the reality that fundamental obligations not to force, coerce, deceive, defraud, manipulate, injure, or the like, which consent generally protects, are met by consent or other measures in medical and research practice. Both non-targeted public health measures and targeted public health interventions can meet these underlying standards. Non-targeted measures must meet them without using consent procedures because it's impossible to say whose consent would be relevant. For example, setting safety standards for medicines or training standards for surgeons are non-targeted measures. Well, I suppose you do target the surgeon's seriatim, but you're not targeting particular patients, are you? Um, and adding fluoride to water that lacks it, or folic acid or iodine to staple foods, if these disperse benefit without injury to individuals, don't require consent from each and every individual and can be done without breaching fundamental obligations. Similarly, for targeted interventions, measures that make it harder for individuals with contagious conditions to transmit them, quarantine or condoms as the case may be, can be justified providing they don't rely on false coercion, fraud, deception or injure without proportionate reason. It will be said that this is impossible because any legal or regulatory measure backed by coercive powers coerces. This seems to me a mistake, although it's a very common one, since the position would make the rule of law itself a form of coercion on a footing with criminal activity. However, this is rather too large an issue to, to, to broach at this point. I simply note that if this were true, many non-targeted measures as well as targeted interventions would have to be seen as coercive. However, legal and regulatory requirements don't work by coercing. Often they work by formative, coordinating, persuasive and exemplary methods. And even when there are legal sanctions and regulation, coercive backing, coercion is quite rarely used. Coercive backing is not the same as coercion. 
Public health ethics operates, I think, in this domain and does not assume that everything that does not or cannot receive consent coerces. So, to conclude, health promotion measures and other targeted public health interventions that will benefit many, and not only or necessarily those targeted, do not require consent from all affected parties. There will, of course, be questions of proportionality to be settled and questions about the limits of permissible harm and risk that non-targeted and targeted interventions may risk. But I think that there is no reason to think either that the only tolerable level of harm is zero or that the only way of making activity that risks harm permissible is by obtaining consent from all affected. The world we live in transmits and disperses benefits and harms among agents in ways that aren't wholly foreseeable or separable. I believe it's illusory to imagine that we need to con obtain consent for everything likely to happen to others who are affected by our action. And if you actually think literally about what that principle would require, uh, we would probably uh, uh, do nothing forever. The most we can do is to try to ensure that what's done to protect or promote public health neither risks disproportionately serious injury nor breaches other fundamental obligations. Thank you very much.